Hello and welcome to Temple Street, the show brought to you by the Department of Communication and Journalism at Suffolk University. I'm Brianna Silva. And I'm Delaney Fischetti. On today's show, we will report on a fair increase at the MBTA, the rise of homelessness in Massachusetts, and the latest renovations to the Suffolk campus. We'll also look at the controversy surrounding Colin Kaepernick's protest, and on a lighter note, an alternative fun night out for adults. Later on today's show, I'll be sitting down with Suffolk University's acting president, Marisa Kelly, and discuss her plans for the university. We'll get to hear the melodic riffs of piano players around the city. And as always, we'll end with our critic at large, Erica Lynch. What do you have for us today, Erica? Thanks, Brianna. This election has been interesting, to say the least. But it's time to look at the big picture, because in a few short weeks, we'll have our new president of the United States. With a drop in temperature and the rise in tea pass prices, college students say they are torn between taking the train or are looking for a more affordable transportation alternatives. Reporters Rosanna Carrado and Calvin Andrade have more on the story. According to the Boston Globe, despite protests, the MBTA board unanimously voted to increase fares by 9.3%, which went into effect July 1, 2016. For commuter students like Alexis Beluccio, this change will amount to an extra $85 spent at the end of the school year. If they're going to raise the prices, you have to see the quality in it. There's delays almost every day for the train, so I'm paying $85 a month, but it takes me 30 minutes to get on the train, so I don't really see where the money's going toward. Along with the increase in prices, the MBTA has removed late-night service, limiting options for those traveling after late evening classes. Boston is a huge college campus area, so on Fridays and Saturday nights when people are going out to the bars and they want to go home, now you have to take either a taxi or an Uber. You can't even take the train home anymore. This change is impacting students but also local workers in Boston. Food vendor Rob McIntyre is unhappy with the change but says the tea is a necessity for some. Uh, it's quite the bummer. I'm going to have to deal with it. Not happy about it, but hopefully it'll be a few more years before they go up again. Although the train is convenient for those who work or go to school in the city, the price increase, along with other issues, may lead to commuters using other, more affordable options like Uber Pool. Uber Pool brings commuters door to door, and depending on the pass you buy, car rides can range from one penny to two dollars. For Temple Street, this is Rosanna Carrado with Kelvin Andrade. Let's hope the MBTA can figure this out before the first snowflake falls, or it's going to be another long winter for Suffolk students. I personally rely on the T every day, but knowing how inconsistent the MBTA tends to be, I might just have to invest in those monthly Uber passes. In other news, the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless says the percentage of people experiencing homelessness here continues to rise. In an effort to raise awareness, Spare Change newspaper is aiming to inspire a community where homeless people can create change for themselves. Erica Lynch and Courtney Colaluca have the story. Spare Change newspaper for the homeless so the homeless can help themselves and have a good day. Established in Boston 1992, Spare Change newspaper got its start by a group of homeless homeless people on a mission to empower themselves and others. Now almost 25 years later, the newspaper currently has over a hundred active vendors. I encourage the, um, for us to motivate ourselves so that we could get more and recruit more vendors. That's about it. So we do need the, the more vendors, the better this organization, it, it will grow a little bit. According to the organization, the $1 newspapers are not only creating an opportunity for their vendors to make a profit, but are also sparking a sense of encouragement in the Boston homeless community. I'm empowering people with information, you know, um, so that they can grow um, in their thinking, you know. I'm helping people to be the best that they can be. The 16-page newspaper is filled with local news on poverty and homelessness and personal stories written by staff, journalists, people experiencing homelessness, and those who want to lend their support to spare change. Suffolk University offers an internship program where seniors connect, create, and contribute to spare change news while teaching them more about the homeless and those at an economic disadvantage, according to recent spare change intern Dylan Santos. So I think spare change has really impacted the Boston community in a positive way by um, kind of bridging that gap between the homeless population and people who aren't part of the homeless population. 
For Temple Street, Erica Lynch and Courtney Colaluca. Spare Change is administering a $1 price increase next month, according to vendor Charles, who says he's excited to have a little more money in his pocket. That truly is such an inspiring story, and I'll be sure to pick up a newspaper to support the cause. Despite recent publicized turmoil regarding Suffolk University's leadership, campus renovation plans were completed and the future construction plans have not been compromised. Emma Doherty and Jackie Bletzer take a look into the changes on campus and the university's future plans. Returning Suffolk University students were excited to see that campus got a summer makeover. Major campus changes started last year with the opening of 20 Somerset Street, an academic building featuring state-of-the-art science and media labs. University efforts to move from Temple Street and centralized campus downtown led to the construction of a new Sawyer lobby, student lounges, and office spaces, a fitness center in Ridgeway, and more office spaces in 73 Tremont. Students kind of have the space to just come out and talk. I mean, Donahue was a good building, but then I had to walk from Donahue all the way to the library because I had a class. Officials say there were a few driving forces behind these renovations. I to make the campus more compact for the sake of the students, and it's just time to move away from the old original buildings to something more modern. And officials say construction is not over. Suffolk plans to further remodel parts of Sawyer to accommodate the New England School of Art and Design, currently located at the Arlington T-Stop. NISAD students will soon be able to join the downtown campus. I'm really excited to get uh, the Fine Arts Department, well, I mean entirety of NISAD, integrated into the, the school on the hill, just because we are so separated. The university also plans to create a space for the Suffolk University Police Department in Ridgeway and build 11 new classrooms on the fifth floor of 73 Tremont. Though most faculty members welcome the changes on campus, some say the move has created difficulties. There have certainly been um, challenges with finding things. <laughs> Finding things like books, papers, um, lecture notes, you know, just having my stuff. So far, renovations have cost the university about $17 million. Officials say upcoming renovations are expected to cost about $10 million. For Temple Street, this is Emma Doherty with Jackie Blutzer. The construction of classrooms in 73 as well as SUPD offices in Bridgeway is underway and the NISAD move is set to begin on May 22nd with plans of opening for summer sessions. Standing, kneeling, sitting, Colin Kaepernick has started a national anthem social protest that sparked both support and controversy. August Wagner took to the streets to ask Bostonians where they stand on this debate. Well, I really don't like him disrespecting the country, that's for sure, but I mean, I, I understand what he's fighting for. I feel like people have their own opinions and they can make their own decisions, like if he chooses not to stand up and put his hand on his heart for the national anthem, then, I mean, that's on him. Uh, I think it goes on the freedom of speech, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. You know, if that's how he feels, then let him be. Honestly, Colin Kaepernick is a good for nothing. He was a waste of money. All he's good for is warming a bench. I think it's a good way for them, the, you know, whoever wants to do that, for them to express themselves. But I also find it disrespectful for the rest of us who really take heart what it stands for. I think it's a little ridiculous, the fact that he like sat or kneeled or whatever you call it during the national anthem. I think it's uh, disrespectful. He's doing something right, standing for, his, for what he knows and standing for equality and stuff. So I think personally, I support him 100%. But the fact that he's still nailed, he's going to do his own thing, he's a public figure, and I feel like people are going to probably take lead and follow him, sort of. But I honestly think he should have stood, and I don't know, it's just, he's going to do his own thing. He's not doing anything uh, violent-wise, he's more, he's doing a very uh, peaceful, non-violent protest, and I do appreciate that as a uh, black man in Boston. Especially the civil rights movement, it took one person to make a change, so it might take one person, like, Colin Kaepernick to make a change in the NFL. With 12 games left in the season, it will be interesting to see how many more players will follow in Kaepernick's footsteps. I've even heard of a few colleges that are taking part in this protest, and in my opinion, I think it's definitely something that needs to be talked about. Delaney, let's just see how far this is going to go. Now on a lighter note, every so often adults need a night where they can act like kids again and just forget about their worries. Legoland Discovery Center at Assembly Row in Boston wants to make that dream come true. 
I join the playground and cover the story. Adult night at Legoland Discovery Center Boston brought those 18 plus back to their childhood with games, an indoor amusement park ride, and of course, Legos. Lots of Legos. I think it gets you away from the everyday, you know, everyday life and it also brings you back to your childhood and gets those creative juices flowing and sort of reinvigorates you as a person. Being the sixth to open in the United States and the 11th worldwide, LDC Boston opened its doors in the summer of 2014 in the first adult night shortly followed, giving Lego fans an excuse to play like kids again. We as a younger generation are working a lot more than probably we should. <laughs> I don't know, at least I am. Um, I don't know, it's good to strike that balance, get a little playtime in. As it turns out, put some Lego blocks in the room and people will immediately get creative, building model cars and even back to school objects. A good brain activity and it's also got a nostalgia factor for those of us who grew up uh, playing with Legos. A mini replica of Boston intrigued crowds with landmarks such as TD Garden, Boston Harbor and even Logan Airport. For Megan Amaral, Legos are not only a fun activity, but a full-time profession that earned her the title Master Model Builder. So I had to compete in a build-off competition um, against other builders, and it was three rounds, timed rounds, with a theme given to us about two minutes before we started, and then a big bin of bricks, and you just had to build. Not only does Amaral take pride in the pieces she builds, she says she loves seeing adults enjoy Legos just as much as she does. I think this adult nights are very important because there are a lot of adults like myself who don't have kids but are really interested in Lego. For Temple Street, Delaney Fischetti. If you missed out on all the fun for this month's adult night, don't worry. There's an event on the third Wednesday of every month with different themes ranging from Halloween to Star Wars and more. Not going to lie, I might just have to show up to the Halloween Legoland adult night. That looked like so much fun. It was. Don't go anywhere. After the break, we'll hear from Suffolk University's acting president, Marisa Kelly. Look at highlights from an event that has united multiple artists worldwide. And hear from our critic at large, Erica Lynch, about the first presidential debate. We'll be right back. It's a short ride from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. shelterpetproject.org. Here's your check. Oh, you, you got it. You know, since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. No. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Kids will spend 15 minutes watching online videos like this one. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. A new school year brought a new president to Suffolk. With 22 years of experience under her belt, Marisa Kelly has outlined many goals for the university. I had the opportunity to sit down with President Kelly and hear about her plans moving forward. Joining us here today is Suffolk University's acting president, Marisa Kelly. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us. Very happy to be here. Uh, tell me what's different about this university in terms of the renovation, the shift in upper administration, and the direction of which the university is going. 
Um, well, let's start with the physical changes. You know, we welcomed our new students and returning students back to campus with a, a lot of physical changes. We've added new lounge space, um, new study space, um, sort of the, the crown jewel of new spaces, the new fitness center, the Michael and Larry Smith Fitness Center, adding 5,800 square feet of um, space for students to, you know, take care of their bodies as well as their minds. Uh, we're really excited about the, um, the environment on campus. Um, there have been a lot of changes, as, as you mentioned, in terms of the leadership of the institution. Um, and, you know, what hasn't changed really is the focus of our faculty and staff um, on our students and on providing the best educational experience uh, for all of you. Um, that has always been, um, you know, critical to who we are as an institution and it continues to be the case and, and will for the foreseeable future. All right, so you're the first president to create the president's blog, which is amazing. What do you hope to accomplish with this form of communication? Well, I really would like to foster avenues of two-way communication on campus. I mean, I can send out email messages, and I do, um, to the campus community, sometimes to all of our constituencies, sometimes to just faculty and staff, or others to, to just students or alumni. And that's great. It's a great way of announcing things and, and letting people know what's happening. But I don't get any feedback that way. Um, so what I really hope is that people will take the opportunity to post comments on the blog. Um, I Checking those, there haven't really been many so far, to be honest, but I would love it if there were. Um, my commitment is to, to be looking at them, to take all of those comments into consideration, and you know potentially to post future blogs based on something that, that someone says. Um, we need more avenues of two-way communication here, and, and that was the most inclusive thing that I could think of that was still manageable, quite frankly, from a, a time perspective. And in the President's blog, you do mention that Suffolk has accomplished many goals within the five-year strategic plan that is submitted to NEASC. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about some of those accomplishments? Um, absolutely. Well, um, for example, in that plan, we commit committed to trying to um, create more seamless operations for students. So just this fall, we opened the RAM Registration and Financial Center on the sixth floor of 73 Tremont. That brings together our registrar's office, financial aid, bursar's office, um, and it's a, you know, really um, a commitment on our part to try to make that experience for students as, as seamless as possible um, and you know, help to, to serve your needs in a, in a more efficient um, and student-friendly way. Um, that was a part of that plan, and as I said, we, we opened that this fall. Um, we have brought together our academic success offices, tutoring and career services, advising, uh, international programs, all on the ninth floor of uh, 73 Tremont. We piloted a new gateway program for first year students last year on the Madrid campus. Continuing that this year, that's something I hope will, will grow from there. So we've done a lot of good things that were specifically um, a part of that plan. We have some more things that we need to do and I hope to, uh, to be able to actually engage the campus community in the coming weeks in a kind of extension of that plan that will take us through the next 18 months to, to two years. Now, going off of that, what goals do you have for the years ahead? Uh, well, um, as I said, we're, we're, I've started this process with the campus community to try to get input using the blog, using some other um, tools, a, a survey. I hope to go to SGA and, t and talk there about, um, y you know, campus, the campus's ideas about uh, what we would like to do in the next year or two. I have my own thoughts about that, but I really want to hear from all of our constituencies to say, you know, we, we've done a lot. What should we try to accomplish? What can we do rowing all in the same direction over the next couple of years uh, together? Uh, we're bringing NISAT, as you may know, up uh, from Arlington Street to the main campus here, and that is really going to be fabulous. It will um, be a great opportunity for those students, um, great opportunity for NISAD faculty and staff, but also, I think, a great opportunity for the whole campus community because we're bringing the whole design, art and design perspective even more centrally to, to what we do. Um, so I'm, you know, excited about that, and by this time next year they will be here and we'll really be working on developing those curricular and co-curricular pathways. Great. And uh, talks about employee uh, raises has raised a lot of awareness around campus. 
Um, you've mentioned before on the blog that eligible Suffolk employees are on their way to getting a raise. Um, but you've also stated that you'd like to increase employee salaries based on their job performances. Um, how do you intend to implement this plan? Well, um, this year, um, the, the raise is just a, a straight general increase for, for faculty and staff in the community, um, which is, I think, important. We want to recognize the hard work that everybody has been doing to, um, to really provide an um, exceptional experience here at Suffolk. Um, but in future years, I would like to build into the budget um, a salary pool that allows us to um, link those increases to um, performance assessments that happen, of course, every year on a regular basis, but we haven't tied recently anyway our, our salary increases to, to those um, assessments. Um, you know, people who are working really hard need to be rewarded for that effort, and um, there's no reason why we can't build that into our plans uh, going forward. You've earned degrees in government and political science uh, at the University of Kansas, San Francisco State University, mm -hmm. and California State University. You've also taught political science at the College of Pacific and University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. What made you leave the classroom in order to seek a higher administration position? Um, you know, when I was a junior faculty member, I um, it was just a matter of timing at that point point. Um, there was a new president who come in, started all these strategic planning conversations, and they wanted a junior faculty perspective. So I ended up um, representing uh, faculty on, on a lot of those forums. And, you know, as that went along and I was asked to do more and more things, I realized that I was kind of becoming um, very interested in institution-wide questions and in questions about higher ed in, in general. And I, I'll never forget the the moment when I realized that I was more interested in reading the Chronicle of Higher Ed than in the American Political Science Review, and I sort of went, "Oh, this this can't be good." Um, and uh, it, you know, after that, uh, not too long after I got tenure, there was an administrative position that opened up uh, as an associate dean, and I threw my hat into the ring, got that job, and I thought that I would miss teaching and that I would not um, want to do it for very long. And I found actually that I really loved it. And I think it was because it was an opportunity to really impact students and to in impact the educational environment, broadly speaking. So rather than impacting exclusively the students in my classes, which you know might be up to 100 in, in any given semester, 100 total, right? Um, I was doing things that were impacting hundreds and thousands of students, and that was really gratifying. Throughout the past 22 years, uh, you've held various leadership roles, uh, five universities, Suffolk being the six. How has this path prepared you for your current one? I um, have taken a pretty traditional academic administrative career path from associate dean to senior associate dean to dean provost, um, provost here at a, a second institution here at Suffolk and, and now acting president. And in each one of those positions, I've, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about the way universities work. I've learned a lot about what to do, what not to do. Um, I, I, it's been a, a great experience. I've had the opportunity to work with boards and alumni, donors, uh, faculty, staff, students, um, you know, from all different perspectives and I've really enjoyed each and every one of those positions a, a great deal so um, I think it's you know right now I'm just drawing on all of those experiences to try to help uh, keep Suffolk forward on um, keep Suffolk focused on uh, on the future and on moving forward well we're really grateful to have you now to conclude this interview what message would you like to share with the Suffolk community this is an incredible institution. I am so proud to be here. I am um, proud to be a part of a community that cares so much about its students at every level, undergrads, grads, professional. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm excited to, to work with everybody on campus to, to keep us focused on the future and I invite you all to, to help me do that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and talking to us mm -hmm. once again. I thank you for it. the invitation. Yeah, I appreciate it too. With someone who's so involved with the school, it's nice to see a president who's so transparent with students and faculty. I agree, Brianna. We are very lucky to have her here at Suffolk. The Street Pianos Festival Play Me on Yours is back with piano music in the air in places like Government Center, Harvard Square, and the Greenway. 
Temple Street reporters Aubrey Dunham and Colleen Twitchell spoke with several local artists who were selected to make sure these pianos captivate your ears and your eyes. Music enthusiasts across Boston have something to be excited about. 60 pianos have been placed from East Boston to Cambridge promoting art installation and encouraging people to showcase their talent. Celebrity Series of Boston launched this project for the first time three years ago, getting over half a million people to play music in the streets of Boston. British creator Luke Jerram says he hopes that these pianos will allow people to express themselves and communicate with one another. It makes me feel good that I can play out in the open because I've never played in front of anyone before. Pianos are set out and displayed with a warm invitation to participate, or as the title suggests, Play Me, I'm Yours. Organizers selected local artists to decorate the pianos through a public application. They were granted access to the pianos back in July. Representing a variety of backgrounds and media, they were given five weeks to complete their work. Needham native Eddie Bruckner spoke to us about the 150 hours he spent working to make his Boston-inspired piano come to life. It took me about 150 hours to paint this. I felt like I should incorporate a lot of other really you know, what are the cool things about Boston, the Zaken Bridge and the Red Sox and the State House and the Tea and a lot of um, things that are recognizable Boston. Organizers say this invitation is open to everybody, not just trained musicians, and welcomes a variety of talent from people of all ages. Skies above are blue well, my heart was Howie Green was also among the 60 artists selected. He explains what it feels like to see his finished product being used and encourages people to get out and play. I came over yesterday afternoon and sat for about an hour just kind of over there just kind of watching people and like 10, 15 people came up and were surprised to see it and sat down and played it and so it was really fun. I, I, loved, I just love it. Yeah, it's great. The pianos will remain on the streets until October 10th. Go enjoy the music and art before time runs out. For Temple Street, this is Aubrey Dunham with Colleen Twitchell. So far, the Play Me I'm Yours installation has reached 50 cities, including London, Singapore, and New York. To find out more about the location of pianos and the art vision behind the piano's decoration, go to hashtag Street Pianos Boston. The 2016 presidential election has sure been a controversial one. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are the most disliked candidates in election history. The fascination resulted in more than 80 million viewers tuning in to the first debate. Temple Street critic Erica Lynch gives her opinion on who came out on top. Thanks, Brianna. Comedian Louis C.K. used the following analogy. If you were on a plane and you wanted to choose a pilot, you have one person, Hillary, who says, here's my license, here's all the thousands of flights that I've flown, here's planes I've flown in really difficult situations, I've had some good flights and some bad flights, but I've been flying for a very long time, and I know exactly how this plane works. And then Trump says, I'm going to fly so well, you're not going to believe how good I'm going to fly this plane. And by the way, Hillary never flew a plane in her life. She did, and we have pictures. No, she never did. It's insane. After the first debate, I don't think this analogy could be more accurate. We live in a world that rejects people from jobs such as being a waitress in a restaurant just because they don't have enough experience. So are we really going to elect someone who has no experience governing to the highest office in the land? I know in America we say everyone can be president, but it doesn't mean that everyone should be president. The fact is, Trump has given us more reasons than not to conclude that becoming a president is one job he is uniquely unqualified to do. Just watching how he handled himself at the debate should be an indicator of how he would react to another leader. No wonder people around the world think we're a joke. And although Hillary hasn't been the best throughout the election season, I think she made a big comeback after the first debate. She handled herself as one would expect from a commander in chief. My opinion, along with many other experts and the polls, is Hillary clearly had the upper hand. Granted, it was confusing at times, and the candidates seemed to focus more on themselves than the issues. Hillary still came out with the win, and I hope undecided voters finally realize that this should be a no-brainer. When you ask people why they don't want to vote for Trump, they say he's crazy, racist, sexist, a bully, yet still won't vote for Hillary. As President Obama said, if you don't vote, that's a vote for Trump. And if you vote for a third party candidate who's got no chance to win, that's a vote for Trump. So why are people still so hesitant to stand by her? 
Yes, people claim it's the trust issue, which is a valid point, but can we really trust Trump? Hillary admitted to her mistakes. He doubles down on his. The Washington Post fact checker says 13% of the statements Hillary made were false, compared to Trump's 65%. That is the only thing Trump is actually doing better than her. She knows what she's talking about, she's well educated, and after her performance at the first debate, I think she gave us a glimpse of how she would take care of business in the White House. Do we want calm, cool, collected, and knowledgeable? or bombastic, hot-headed, and ignorant. I mean, who would you want representing you? The smart kid or the bully? As a final thought when filling out that ballot on November 8th, First Lady Michelle Obama said this, remember, it's not about voting for the perfect candidate. There's no such person. In this election, it's about making a choice between two very different candidates with a very different vision for our nation. And that's why I'm with her. Very valid points, Erica. And one thing is for sure, it's going to be an interesting ne next couple of months. You know, I feel like Clinton and Trump, they're like cats and dogs. They're always going at it each other. So I'm curious to see who America will choose as our leader. Well, that's all we have for today's show. Thank you from all of us here at Temple Street. I'm Brianna Silva. And I'm Delaney Pachetti. We'll see you next time.